Give us any chance, we'll take it. Read us any rule, we'll break it. We're gonna make our dreams come true. Welcome to Night After Night, a podcast about eight seasons in a row. I'm Lisa Fernandes and... I am Christopher Jai Wardena. And we're here with One Flew Over Milwaukee, which is still... We're still in season one. We're still trucking along. And this episode was directed by Michael Kidd, who has an amazing, amazing, amazing resume. Mm. You want to get into that a little bit? Yeah, let's take... Let's, I mean, I'm going to go ahead and okay. look up and see if there's any names I recognize, but I should... I, I need to start being more professional doing my research on these directors now. I actually told you about him before. I think you did. I told you about him before, and I was like, look how amazing his resume is. Oh, yeah. yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Please, yes. please, yes, please, please, please go through. Go, go into this. This was magical. I was turning it over to you. You're the film guy. Oh, I'm the film guy. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> hey, you're, you're you're a bit of a nerd yourself. Don't don't tell yeah, yourself. Yeah, sure. well. Um, but yeah, Michael Kidd um, was well known as as a uh, rather fantastic uh, fight. Uh, sorry, fight choreographer. Sorry, I'm an action guy, so I often say fight choreography when yeah. I say dance choreographer. Um, there you go. With credits such as The Bandwagon, Guys and Dolls, Star, and. Um, he also moved into uh, doing a little bit of directing with this episode, uh, as well as Mary mm-hmm. Andrew. And as an actor, mm-hmm. had some uh, some fine appearances in uh, films such as It's Always Fair Weather and Smile. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of cool to see you know somebody like this who was a you know well known person who had worked with uh, um, who had worked with you know well known actors of the kind of old mm-hmm. Hollywood scene, getting a chance to do something kind of different, and um, yeah, and in this this case, it was it was pretty neat. It was pretty good, but yeah, yeah. it's it kind of yeah. Go oh, ahead. No, I, I I was kind of trailing off. Go ahead. He also choreographed Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. That will that'll be a major credit. A lot of folks are going to remember him for. Uh, it's very interesting. You can tell in the one dance scene we do get. With Shirley and Carmine, right in the middle of the party scene, you could kind of see his influence. Yeah, so it's really, really fascinating. It's very interesting mm-hmm. the way he uh, chooses to block that scene off, the way he chooses to shoot it, mm-hmm. the way it uh, comes and together. Rather, this is also written by. Sorry, I was just going to say he even makes sure to frame the uh, the couch a bit, blocking the legwork, so just in case there's any mm-hmm. padding or any sort of like steps on the floor or anything on there, you know, you can't you can't see their feet too much during the shot. Now, it's probably just to save extra time, especially when you're uh, shooting a sitcom. Oh, God. It's all boom, 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 boom. Oh, yeah. For all we know, there's this marks underneath the uh, the couch yeah. that they then have to t- pick up and then they have to put back down. The ACs yeah. are just like, God yeah. damn it. Why, why are we doing this again? <laughs> <laughs> Let's not talk about the set strife. The set strife will come and oh, no. we're out from the past and get us all. <laughs> we are you've all heard about it we're not going to go over it again and again okay this was this episode was also written by michael warren and william bickley and here's the plot summary shirley buys a canary duane from a coal miner so he won't end up taxidermied and perched and perched permanently on the hat of a lady all much to laverne's horror you see shirley gets super attached to her animals and then in laverne's words she gets crazy Predictably, Shirley soon at, is soon up all night, tapping on a rock to try to get Dwayne to sleep and singing the Tennessee Ernie Ford tune 16 tons to him. When Dwayne flies out the open window after she lets him out of his cage for exercise, she's tum- she tumbles down into the dumps. The Vern thinks that hosting a party to celebrate Lenny's entering the Army Reserves is just what Shirley needs to feel better, but when the window blows open as she's dancing with Carmine, Shirley purchases herself by the window and refuses to leave until her bird returns. So what do you think of this episode? This was cute. Um, yeah, I mean, as, I'm going to have that as my immediate reaction to a lot of episodes. But the this is very much an interesting TV show episode to me as a it, it covers the aspect of belief and kind of, you know, as or if not super very something very sweet and very innocent um, yeah. about Shirley as a character and giving her this development as a kind of lovingly gullible uh, person. It, it kind of is in, yeah. it's endearing and it's also um, 
it's kind of scary a little bit because you see the 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 yeah. the the dangers that she can be, that can befall her. You know, I mean, she's going to get sick. She's going to you know, get pneumonia, bronchitis, or you know, yeah. catch her death. You know, from an open snowy yeah. window. Yeah. And yeah. I, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, um, to, to I guess to just quickly finish the point though is is I thought what was kind of nice though is that you know whereas sometimes. I think especially today, there is this sense of like having to change a person. And Mm -hmm. what I like is that this is just something you have to learn and accept about who she is. And I, I, and so, yeah, I thought that was very, at times very heartwarming. Um, It also combines that with the wonderful absurdity of the story of how Dwayne comes to their lives with the story of the coal miner and then the element of putting him to sleep with, you know, banging on the rock and, (laughs) <laughs> which was delightful. Yeah, I I enjoyed the episode. I I wouldn't say I love the episode, but it was it was quite good. Yeah. It was it was quite cute. It was sweet. Um, you know, it's it's got you know Mister Rags to Riches, uh, uh, you know Carmine quite a bit, which I have yeah. mixed feelings about. Um, the, the interesting thing about this episode is all about faith. Is what it's about. It's about her faith that this bird is going to come back. He's going to arrive. He's going to be there. All she has to do is just be patient. And it doesn't matter what anybody says to her, anybody, mm, mm. even her erstwhile boyfriend, even her best friend. She's going to stay there until she sees that little speck of yellow in the snow. And then ultimately, while the universe rewards her and doesn't reward her, and it, then, then it rewards her again, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And it shows, also shows how far both Carmine and Laverne will go for her, Good. which is pretty darn far. Yeah. That's, that, that's one of the best parts of the episode, how deep that uh love runs i agree especially about how far laverne gets to go here to do something for her friend because i you know in the first few episodes we were commenting how you know especially like in bowling for uh, you know bowling for shots for instance is um sorry uh, bowling for raspberries raspberries, excuse me um raspberries yeah yeah um but the i love raspberries (laughs) uh but that you see Shirley mother henning Laverne, and what's kind of interesting here is Laverne's acting like a big sister to Shirley and yeah. doing something for her that it's a lie, but she's doing it out of a kindness and a love that she has for her. Yeah. Which is ultimately, ultimately what drives the two of them is that sense of, of emotional fidelity in their friendship. Like, it, it doesn't matter what's happening. It's the two of them against the world a lot. And that is a lot of what makes this show so special. It's about sisterhood. It's really about sisterhood. Right, And right. their sisterhood is what keeps the world spinning. And that's as it should be. This is the first episode we get about Shirley's devotion to animals. There's going to be at least two more coming up in future seasons. Uh, what do you think about this aspect of her character? <sighs> You know, what I like about it is, I mean, we'll say one thing. It reminds me of my mom, which is because my mom, Aww. my mom is a lot like Shirley in that respect, that she has a lot of faith. Yeah, she has a lot of love. She's she yeah. absolutely adores animals. And she. As I was growing up, there certainly were many times that she did sometimes perhaps put a little too much faith and get a little carried away. But you could tell her heart was in the right place and that she was. And so, yeah. that you know, I, I liked that. Um, and. As in terms of developing as for Shirley, I think it's an interesting counterbalance. I think we were discuss- we've discussed this yeah. before on, about the show is yeah. there's this wonderful bouncing back and forth of Laverne's cynicism and Shirley's optimism and yeah. getting to see it. I think this episode really illustrates it. And it also illustrates how Laverne makes this interesting compromise to be a little more optimistic, um, yeah. especially at the end, you know, now because, you know, I love how it concludes with they both have a bird now. And it's kind of like it works out for both of them. Like in a way, yeah. Laverne's kindness is also rewarded, which I think is is rather yeah. sweet. Dwayne and Eddie, which is really a fun little fifties joke. It's a nice little simple fifties joke that works really well. Mm. So, um, yeah, what we end up getting here is um, an episode. This aired on a word. Because in the last episode, Lenny was already firing the gun in the reserves, and now he's just entering the reserves, and we're having a, they're having a party for him. Yeah. And it's like, that that's a total um, order issue, which surprised me, because I didn't think that they were that far out of, or, out of airing order. But, you know, what do you think of this, like, aspect of this guy going into the military? 
this guy of all people. It it explains a lot. No, I'm, I, I, okay, that's mean. That's mean. Um, <laughs> but uh, the but that's the thing. I I think part of also with Lenny is we'll get we'll, we'll get to this I think soon because I because um I was reviewing some of the episodes we're going to be doing up pretty soon. Yeah. Lenny is so much a kid. And when you're a boy, you want to go, the party wants to go join the army army and fight, especially if you're a very physical kid. And he's a very physical guy. He's a very wild, loose, you know, gangly guy. And, and yet as well, it, I think sort of, especially speaking of it from the perspective of the fifties, this is a guy who, a young man who grew up on war movies post-World War II. I mean, you figure, okay, so if he's around like say 20, 21 to maybe 23 at this point in the show, that means yeah. that he was. Yeah. He's about to be. Go ahead. Uh, he's about he's about twenty two, twenty three in season one. They're all around twenty two, twenty three. Okay. I think. So let's see. So let's do the math backwards. If that means it's around fifty seven, fifty eight, then mm-hmm. he was twelve. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was about. That means that he was probably about ten, or a little younger when World War Two ended. Yeah. And so he's hearing yeah. all these. So, I mean, you're going to, this is, these are blue collar people. They're going to be hearing all the stories. And so yeah. he's going to be hearing those stories about the war and about going and fighting for the cause and growing up on the movies mm-hmm. and the feeling and sense of, of patriotism. And so I, I, yeah. I like that aspect of that character, you know, because it doesn't come from a, Hey, I'm going to go join the war and, and kill people, especially yeah. given yeah. what's coming, yeah. you know, another, you know, five years <laughs> after this yeah. point. Um, yeah. It's still the idealism. It's still that patriotic idealism. Yeah. And, you know, I appreciate that. I, yeah. and, and I also, under, yeah, yeah. And I, cause I mean, I, you know, when I was younger, you know, I, I, I God, it's, it feels weird for me to say that considering how old some of the people who love the show are, um, hi there to our, our veteran lis- listeners. Um, but, uh, I, uh, hola boomers, hola boomers. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> the, uh, when I was younger, though, I mean, I knew people who joined the military, like after 9-11 and after, you know, like yeah. the start of the oh, war yeah. in Iraq and stuff like that. And, mm-hmm. you know, there's there's kind of a certain mental discipline um, that yeah. of why you do it today. But it's uh, so I mean, less people do it now. But it's clear that, you know, there's a certain feeling that people get like a certain type of person will do that. Um, there's a long yeah. rambly way of saying, I get it. I thought it was interesting. Um I don't 100 percent agree with it from a narrative perspective, just because it feels like something that's yeah. going to dead end. Like if I was so say, for instance, yeah. I was doing the show today um, set still in yeah. the 50s. I wouldn't have had him yeah. join even the reserves just because I have a feeling that yeah. would have backfired eventually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of complication with that it, it continues. This is a continues being a theme all the way through season five. There are episodes where he's still there and the girls eventually join up. And there was nearly a pilot set there, which we already discussed. Uh, but yeah, uh-huh. which is an issue. But this gets completely dropped when they head to California, as it ought to be, because we were heading to Vietnam years. Right. Nobody wants Lenny and Squiggy in Vietnam, which is what we would have ended up with if that pilot had taken off. Yeah, I, I still say, I mean, we, we were, I think we were talking about this privately, is that what I would do is just turn that show about those two guys, about them going AWOL and doing like a road movie. You know, and then there's they they yeah. start they take the band on the road and they're trying to hide from you know every recruiter they can find and they're trying to dodge the draft and you know yeah that actually would have been really cool yeah that, I actually think that would have been really cool it would have been like a weird that's what I, that's, yeah this yeah. bizarre mixture of Gary Marshall sitcom and Bob Rafelson drama yeah that actually would have been really 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 interesting because ultimately what they were do going to do was. Uh, but yeah, we already, we already discussed this in the previous episode about two boys being in the army. That was going to be their spinoff, and they only did a pilot of it. It didn't sell, which is interesting because almost every single Marshall pilot sold during that era. I mean, we got out of the blue, of all things, on the air. Mm-hmm. We got Joni Loves Chachi. We got Blansky's Beauties. A lot of his stuff ended up out there because he was doing so well with that one, two, three punch of Happy Days, uh, Laverne Shirley, and Morgan Mindy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You could basically could not have done any wrong, so all of his pilots are getting launched. So the fact that that didn't go fascinates me. It really fascinates me. I want to know what the heck happened where they just pulled the pulled the plug out on it. Yeah, and so, for all we for all we know, it was something innocuous. Like some person said, yeah. "Well, the focus research said that the reruns of Hogan's Heroes isn't doing very well." Yeah, yeah, could be just be that simple. 
this it's just really fascinating to me that that of all things the network didn't take it i don't know what the heck happened so no well and there's like no footage of it there's like no there's a, a couple of stills of the set i think and that's it I haven't even seen any stills of Michael and David on the sets of Getty. Wow. But I think they exist. Those stills of the set exist somewhere. I'll have to look them up. But um, hmm. yeah, that that could have been the future, but it's not the future, so to speak. Right. <laughs> of the show. Yeah. So we get a lot of Carmine and Shirley's relationship in this episode of him kind of trying, devoting his attention to try to cheer her up. Yeah. Dances and dancing with her, you know, kind of trying to take care of her. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel about the relationship as it's evolving so far? So that's that's very interesting because I find Carmen is a character I can already kind of tell. They, they're having difficulty at this stage in the show just trying to figure out what to do with them. And here it feels like they're starting to lock into like, okay, like, yeah, I think erstwhile boyfriend or erstwhile, you know, date, basically, you know, the eternal date. Like they're not really. Yeah dating they're just kind of like took that one date in high school and like they've just sort of continued it you know in an off and on sort of sense <laughs> um yeah so here it's it's coming together and but yet at the same time as well i think it, it's interesting they sort of show a certain limit with it with the fact that you know he still decides to go to the party at the pizza bowl and leaves her behind you know yeah and he does yeah. immediately he does come back first you know before everyone else does um but it's that I, again, this is just one of those. It's just me. I ain't, I'm not leaving my girlfriend by the snowy window waiting for her bird. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, you know, find a space heater or something or get, you know, all of the blankets. It's like, you know, be supportive about about this or yeah. say, you know, listen, let's at least go outside and like walk around enough that, you know, we stay warm and we're not, you know, freezing to death. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's a, it's a mixed bag. It's like, there's, there's very sweet stuff. I mean, the dancing he does with her is, um, surprisingly intimate. I felt actually, but yeah, I, I have yeah. weird hangups on dancing. That's fr some friends of mine can tell me about that. It can tell anybody about that. <laughs> I hope they don't, but they could. Um, <laughs> That's interesting, guys. <laughs> Go ahead. uh, yeah. Anyway, that was, that was my take. Yeah. I, there, this whole relationship goes up and down like a horse stuck to a merry-go-round. It really does. Like, <laughs> it, it is a horse just like posted to that damn merry-go-round, just going around the organ music, around the organ music, and and you know, so you get really beautiful, sweet scenes of the two of them. Really beautiful, nice stuff. And then, you know, what happens in the next episode coming happens in the next episode coming. Mm -hmm. And you just want to kick him in sensitive places. Mm -hmm. And it's like, am I supposed to root for this guy? Am I supposed to root for Shirley? What am I supposed to feel? Uh, what is, you know, what is the direction of this? And it, it they kind of try to settle in somewhere around, uh, I'd say probably around season three or season four, where it becomes really hot and heavy. Mm. And then it, you think that in season six they kind of, they kind of go with that, but then they don't, and it's like a, it's messy. It's very messy. But all the all the parts where he is, you know, at least being helpful here, are nice and sweet and good. Hmm. And yeah. the fact that he would rather hang out with Lenny and Squiggy at the pizza bowl is interesting to me because God knows, as the series goes on, he would rather do anything but. Right. You know. Yet, yet here he just gladly goes off with them like just to be warm right so yeah and and, interesting. and and that's the thing is like there's that, that element of of selfishness from him in situations like that that i find that you kind of see a little hints of too i mean like him even being at the bachelor party and you know that it's just like they, yeah. they just feel like ha huh, okay yeah and yeah yeah it, i wonder if this was a case of where carmine is a character with someone like and, and i guess specifically the relationship between him and, and shirley was something where the audience sorry not the audience sorry the writers couldn't quite just like decide like as in like some of the writers or one or two of the writers had like well it's going to be this and another one or two writers said it was going to be that and so you can feel that feel almost like a split um and admittedly yeah. as, as much as i complain about it as we're i think we were d discussing this a long time back is i do feel it is yes, it is more realistic. I've seen people in relationships like that where it's like they stay together for years, and I wonder what are you doing with this person? What are you doing? <laughs> like this is not healthy for either of you. Neither of you is happy. This person can't make up their mind if they want you, and so on and so forth. But, but eh, eh, it's eh, 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 eh. It's kind of that um, 
Joe Jackson principle. You know what I mean? Is she really going out with him? Hmm. It's kind of that, mm, that, mm. that bitter, it's kind of that, that, that feel of like, why are you wasting your time with this dude sometimes? And sometimes, oh yeah, I get it. I kind of get it. But why are you with this guy sometimes? And it gets worse. It's, Laverne goes through way worse relationships, like really awful relationships, terrible relationships in comparison to everything that Shirley goes through with Carmine. Mm-hmm. But even uh, Shirley and Carmine with their settled down relationship and, even at their best, you kind of go, well, okay, you feel, you guys feel this way about each other. Why are you seeing other people? Or mm-hmm. why are you doing this? Or why are you calling her frigid? You know, you know she's not frigid. You're making out with her. Mm-hmm. You're standing in the middle of the room making out with her, dude. And it's like, uh, yeah, that, yeah. We will go, we're going to continue yeah. to have it- embattled Shirley and Carmine feelings forever, I fear. <laughs> it's like, that's just... Um, that's just the way the relationship bounces, as Squiggy might say. Hmm. But, you know, you know what I really noticed about this episode was the scratch effect snow. Yes. The, the shot, the establishing shots. And I was like, oh my god, they did actually do scratch effect snow. I didn't even know they actually did that on TV in the 70s. Yeah. I, yeah, that it, was funny. Yeah, it, was, it just kept giving me Where Eagles Dare flashbacks. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh. Carefully Which, yeah. scratch the films carefully. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's some of it. Sometimes it scratches. I mean, I I suspect it looked like sc- scratches, but it also had the effect of. I'd have to look at the images imagery of it again, but it, it felt like it was a mixture of that and maybe a bit of processing. I'm not sure, but but yeah, it was some weird. It, it, the optical the optic effects on it for the snow on those exterior shots was amusingly primitive, and uh, you know, yeah. Which I mean, I. <laughs> I, I suppose I shouldn't talk given some of the uh, BS ways I've gotten around effects in my own movies, <laughs> to be honest. Hey. But yeah. Hey, when you got when you got the budget you got, you make do. That's, that's just true. what you gotta do, and that's just yeah. what's gonna happen. Yeah. Like with <sighs> with um this is was before like the big money boom for the show. This is just the first season. Mm-hmm. Uh it was successful right out of the gate. It was the third most popular show. Oh wow. In the country. On the, during the first season, that was for a mid-season replacement. That's and not it was top bad. Three, and then it became the number two show in the country with season two, and that was just that November over. It started in January, wow. uh, and then they came back in September, and it just sh- kept shooting up, up and up, up the charts. Goodness. So, but they they that would start showing in the budget a little bit more in the second season, the third season. Uh, and set dressing, but they would try, try, try until season six to keep everything looking blue collar. The uh, girls and guys would continue to rewear, actually rewear their wardrobe. You will notice outfits will keep coming back that yeah. they wore before, which keeps everything properly blue collar because these girls would not be able to afford to go out and keep shopping and keep shopping and getting new outfits. So the way they handle the budget on the show is really, really interesting to me. Because you can tell what it was spent on and what it was um, what was important when it came to what Gary Marshall wanted to say with the show, mm-hmm. even as it gave him an ulcer. Oh <laughs> as my he himself God. basically admitted. <laughs> yeah. He always said that this is the series that um, was the hardest to do for him. Wow. Now, Happy Days is a breeze, everyone was family. Mork and Mindy, you had Robin there, and but everything was like smooth because everybody got along, everything was fine. Yeah, all was one shot, little one season ones, and then everybody was screaming on the set of the show. Oh my gosh! And that was yeah. Uh, this this is his tough one. Then he had to deal with his family. All of his family was on the show. Oh man, and, uh, yeah. Which which I can say. I mean, there's there's benefits to working with your family on your stuff. I mean, you know, when we were writing, doing the uh, when we did the wraparound for my, the anthology, I, I ended up finishing the production of for spunk's not dead um mm-hmm. the wraparound segment mm-hmm. my dad and i co-wrote it dad and i shot it dad and i edited it my mom did props and then aside from that it was it was a makeup artist an actor and an extra filmer for a day and like yeah, yeah. like that was you know so it was just the three of us you know i mean we did all our monster yeah. the monster shots we did in our garage together benefits to it because you know you're constantly working on it so it's like instead of having to go to the office or make a phone call you literally just go down to the kitchen and say like hey man how's how's things coming which is great but then also it's like you have to deal with the fact that like oh god it's it's parents it's family it's people that 
they know my weaknesses and then also that you can't yeah. you can't push them yeah. a certain amount because then it's it's like oh, but yeah. i don't want to say what i want to say because i could push an actor this way but i can't push my mom this way or my dad this way yeah so yeah 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 well like i said penny's father and gary's father was the executive producer and he did at least once hold her pay for smarting off to him so i mean that's amazing that's the kind of family that's, dynamic that's amazing I, I i love that story it's horrible but i love that story i know I know, I know. And uh, their sister Ronnie uh, worked, I think, in casting. I'm going to triple check that. But she worked in casting. Hmm. And she appears on the show in season eight. Oh, no. She appears on the show on camera. That's funny. Uh, did, it does just, did anyone just hear the Jaws theme for a minute there? Mm. Season eight. Oh, God. Season eight. Oh, God. Season eight is coming. Season eight. Season eight. <laughs> 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 when when you have like several actors on the show just flat out saying it was a mess i'm sorry it was a mess we shouldn't have done that that way you know it's a bad time yeah it's a, you know it's a bad time yep. when enough people confirm it then then such is true especially about film sets especially about film sets uh, but it was like yeah that I, I'm gonna have to look up the story that Penny told uh, to uh, the uh, American. I think it was the the American Television Institution. Mm. I think it was uh, it was it was. Uh, oh God, what the heck was it? Uh, I think it was them. I'm gonna have to look that up. But she told a story about how to avoid filming season eight, she tried to hide from ABC just to avoid the situation after everything broke down with Cindy. And turned into a legal brohaha, which we'll get to. Wow! So, we're... oh, it was a it was a legal brohaha. It was a mess. Oh and man! I will research it. God, yeah. it's it's like it, this is so. This is becoming slowly one of those movies where like you have like those little flash forwards to uh to like the aftermath of like some disaster. This it, basically yeah. this is the usual suspects, right? These are these little flashes forward yeah. of the story of like yeah. what happened on the boat, what yeah. happened on the boat, and we. Yeah. Uh, haven't yet gotten back to understand, you know, and finally at the end, we're going to culminate and know who Kaiser Soze is. Kaiser Soze was a- Kaiser Soze is the nun with the pickle. I was about to say it was a nun, it had, it had, it was the pickle. Yeah. And now I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just imagining it was, it was, it was Chaz, right? Chaz Palmentary plays the cop. He's just dropping this pickle on the ground <laughs> yeah. and you just see Kobayashi on it. I, Kaiser Soze is multiple people, multiple things in season eight. It's the mummy groom. It's the nuns with the pickles. It's Laverne in a spacesuit floating in the air as Charles Fleischer yells at her. It's everybody getting possessed by the ghosts of 1910 Olympic runners. It's uh, whoa. It's a mess. I it's a mess. I had to stop my eyes from widening because I don't think they can widen that far without popping out. <laughs> oh boy. Um, Wow. It's okay. Coming. So I guess this is another preview of coming attractions. Good Lord. That is, that is a terrifying future vision. Um, I know how Garnet feels now. It's an entire gospel number f featuring a prison inmates doing the Shalmiel Shalmazel song. It's, uh, That's wild. it's a lot of things. Anyway, uh, steering things back to nicer, gentler, frostier <laughs> times with adorable birds. Um, yeah. Yes. So, uh, Anyway, um, but yeah, I mean, I there were a lot of things I did appreciate in One Flew Over Milwaukee. It's a, um, yeah. as I think I said, I've said this before, is that it, it feels very much like an episode of a TV show, and that's just going to happen with sitcoms from this era. Is that it's like, oh yeah, yeah. it's an episode. But there's some definitely some highlights. Yeah. I I like you know as we were saying, like when you really think about some of the things that are happening, there's some depth that's there, especially with uh, regards to Lenny, say for instance, and and the depths, especially the depth of Laverne and Shirley's yeah. relationship, and how we're getting to see kind of a, a refinement or a nuance to the dynamic, which I think was really sweet. Yeah. And I even love one of the, my favorite touches, just to make sure I don't forget this, because it just came to mind. Is when Laverne, you know, is having to go to sleep and eventually is 16 ton, what do you get? And then when yeah. Laverne's going out to get the paper in the morning, and the paper of the mail yeah. in her bathrobe, she's still doing the song. Like she's now got it stuck in her head, yeah. but she's yeah. not doing it yeah. in a grumble. It's sort of like, eh, okay, you know, yeah. my my roommate's a little nuts, yeah, kinda, but she's my she's family. Yeah. So I you know, I love her. So, you know, yeah. I deal with it. It's kinda it's gotten catchy. It's caught up in her head. She kinda it's not finally having fun with it after not getting any sleep. She's right. getting some kind of sleep because she's too chipper for not having any sleep. Oh yeah, certainly. Yeah, 
I took some caffeine pills or something. They just partied all night until the bird fell asleep. <laughs> oh, no, that's a different show. <laughs> that's a different show from the 70s. It was some show from the 70s. That was a different show. <laughs> Uh, my probably my favorite little tiny line in here is um, when uh, Shirley was, I talk about how um, it was magic or a fate that brought Dwayne back to her, and uh, it was a, you know, some kind of the wind blowing him back to her because the wind blew the bird into Frank's apparently part-time lover's uh, mm-hmm. window there, mm-hmm. and she said, and Laverne goes, "Nah, I think it's just cheap building." And I just love that line. I love that line. Yeah. I love that line. This is this perfectly delivered, perfectly perfect, cynical Laverne, perfect. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, what would you? So, you know, to, to to flip things around, how would you rate this? You get to go first. Hmm. This is right around mid range for me. There's a lot of cute stuff. It's not my favorite Shirley plus animals episode. That's probably it's a dog's life, which is coming up around season four, I think. Mm. See the season four or season five, and that's really cute. We also get a whole horse episode. It's really, 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 really adorable. That's season three. Um, but her interaction with Dwayne is adorable. Her faith is adorable. Uh, I love everything about Laverne just going the extra mile, just throwing the bird mm-hmm. as hard three, as she can. Three times. Toward her best friend. Three times. Three times. Three times, kids. Just to make sure that her best friend is happy and satisfied at last. And make sure she'll, you know, stop freezing to death out by the window. Mm-hmm. I loved all the little details about, you know, Lenny deciding to be a military guy and he's, you know, private. He's got his girl, his date beside him. And Laverne just looking at him going, who's your friend, Len? And he's just like, and yes, she, and then the girls have to introduce themselves. The fact that uh, Lenny and Squid Game dates, the girls don't know who the heck they are. The girls introduce themselves and they can't remember their names. Yeah, I, I don't I love think that. Shirley can remember Squiggy's dates. Babe. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it surely I can't remember that. either. And that's another detail I love is Laverne with the coats. Yeah. It's just, just completely. Trying to turn the record player on. Right. Trying to turn the record player on and off at everybody's request. Uh, and that was a very that's precarious a- place to put all those records, by the way, on the little banister by the landing. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, yeah. that maybe oh yeah as, as somebody who you know collects a lot of like stuff like you know i have shelves of yeah. dvds and video games and stuff that terrified me a little bit <laughs> oh, yeah. all the weight all that weight just going yeah right to, right through the right through the cheap balsa wood of the apartment <laughs> <laughs> like, oh god yeah I'm, but, I'm a little bit that's that's gonna be the one problem with the anybody of my generation who's a record collector watching this episode it's like oh just, don't uh, this, this no. does not sound proper don't put them in like what is that a dish rack don't do that no Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a great uh, there's actually we eventually get a few great episodes that revolve around music mm. later 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 into the um into the show we do get a visit from fabian coming in season three hmm. you can look forward to that so and we unfortunately 70s are a fabian versus 50s are a fabian which is what we should look like but hey hey what can you do yeah <laughs> just time happens C'est la vie. time happens as rick nelson said if it was all well i gave i'd rather drive a truck <laughs> <laughs> oh okay what would you rate this one I would give this, I think, very much similar. There's a lot I like about it, kind of good, good, decent mid tier. Like, if I was to give this on our, our you yeah. know, one to 10 scale, I put this at like seven and a half for sure. Yeah. There are parts of it that yeah. are about an eight or nine, just like there's certain scenes and certain gags yeah. that are just, they land yeah. perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, um, yeah, there's a, there's a really good, genuine i guess like honest sweetness about it that really i liked yeah. and I, I when i went back and rewatched it just to make just to make sure i you know kind of covered it again this past week um yeah. and i watched it with um i think i watched it with my mom as well and she she really she really liked it she enjoyed seeing the um you know just seeing the 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 i guess the dedication the steadfastness of shirley's character yeah um yeah but it's really sweet right and and i mean she thought i mean you know obviously you know both of us thought the whole story of like the coal miner and it's like and just you know and it's like the bird was free and then like oh but then the accessories like how much did that cost 30 dollars i think it was, it was 30 dollars right or 35 <laughs> yeah it was yeah so like 35 and that was like close to what they would make in a week i think yeah i think this was uh, like that was said uh, yeah oh uh, god 
Yeah, it's going to be a little tough on the bill on the food bills for the next couple of weeks then. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Speaking of, this is one of the rare times we get to see Laverne cook. That's right. Laverne is notoriously awful at cooking. That's right. And isn't that, um, then also, this is, is this the one, this is the one, right, with the line, um, and it's like, Pop, what about, when, when is, when is too much? What do you mean if I was married, I would know? Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. That's the line. Yeah. Ah, Frank. But yeah. Let your girl be single, Frank. Let your girl be single. <laughs> Watch out who she'll marry. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's the thing is you know he's gonna understand that with someone that spunky and and um uh stubborn, you you gotta you just yeah. a, just an ounce of reverse psychology goes a long way. Like, uh, eh, who cares? Yeah. Who cares if you get, by the end of by season eight, he doesn't care. <laughs> he stops hammering the Italian thing really hard. He's like, eh, no, who cares? Who cares? Go ahead. And it's like Wow. But uh, by the time by the time season eight happens, she just you know cycles boyfriends in and out, and it's just like a mess. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> season eight is a mess. Everyone thinks so. Anyway. <laughs> so yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is there, yeah. yeah. Is there anything? Is there anything else we uh, we got to cover for this episode? Is there anything? I, I feel like I feel yeah. like there's something I'm missing, like something I'm forgetting, but I'm I'm not sure. I might be conflating this with other episodes that are coming up. Now, the only thing that's really running through my head is Squiggy's quote. I got to comb my hair with antifreeze. Oh, I love so, that. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Oh, my God. Got to comb my hair with antifreeze. Ah. Yeah. 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 I got to work on my voice. My voice for that. No, it's pretty good. It's, it's not bad. Yeah, it's... it's not that bad. I've heard worse Squiggy impressions. <laughs> believe me. Anyway. Yep. Oh, man. All right. That, that's. That's about a six for me too. It's really like lying right in that. It's very, it's good, not the best, mm -hmm. not the absolute best for me. Yeah, cool. I think that's about it. That's about it for this week. Awesome, cool. Well, thanks again, everybody, for joining us for night after night. And uh, if you want to hang out a little bit more with us, you can check out our other episodes. And uh, we also are around on uh, Twitter at night after night pc and uh, night after night pod on most other services you can also send us fan mail at night after night pod at gmail.com and uh, we also have the patreon if you'd like to support us and help us get to hopefully i, I guess yeah we're going to be trying to set up some incentives in the future yes yes yeah and i have some excellent ideas for incentives yeah awesome yeah yeah lisa here has been coming up with some fantastic ideas it could be Pretty nice, pretty pretty uh, smooth there. And uh, yeah, it just make sure to look out for us in the future. And uh, I think, yeah, it's the main place. Yeah, we're on the Twitter. We have a Facebook. We have a Tumblr mm -hmm. and the Patreon. I think that's the main places. And, and the YouTube, which uh, which I think, yeah, we'll just, we'll just kind of see how this goes. We're just continuing to ride along. But uh, anyway, Lisa, would you like to let the folks at home know what's next for them? Well, it's true. Well, Carmine dumps Shirley. <laughs> that's your basic. That's your basic preview for dating slump. All right, so cool. Carmine gonna, dumps Shirley. Yeah. Okay. So cool. I guess we're gonna get to hate on Carmine next time. Awesome. I'm looking forward to that. Let's punch Carmine in the nuts. The podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is it too late for me to redo the poster? Okay. I'll have to. I'll just. I'll have to look into that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just change the microphone with a with a just a like a sack of nuts. <laughs> I'm I'm talking like a, a bag of peanuts, by the way, people. I'm talking about. I, I'm, I'm, I know. I'm speaking. I'm, I'm thinking. It's kung pao, kung pao. That's a lot of nuts. <laughs> that's a lot of nuts. <laughs> Boy, it's a lot of nuts. Uh, oh god, that's okay. that's that's the note we're ending on, aren't? Isn't it? <laughs> that's the note we're ending on. Yep, that's the note we're ending on. Until next time, everybody. Go get some mixies. <laughs>